while the emotional trauma finally gets to all the characters in the episode that changes the show forever. Hey guys, here remember Luke Cage, Season 1, Episode 7, Manifest, and holy shit, this episode was insane, it really was. If I thought the last episode was crazy, that is nothing compared to this episode. I honestly can't believe what this show did. This is one of the ballsiest... Uh, risk-taking, just really emotional episodes I've seen it of any of these Marvel series, and I will, there is definitely that comparison to the Daredevil episode Penny and Dime in this episode, but I'm gonna talk about why this episode is different from that, but let's just get into this episode because there's so much to talk about. This video is probably gonna be almost 40 minutes long, I have so much to say about this episode. This by far was the best episode of the season. I think it's up there with the top five uh, Marvel TV episodes so far. I loved everything about it. It was so riveting. It was so interesting. And just everything that went down in this episode, again, felt like a season finale. Even though the last episode felt like a season finale, this really, everything in this episode felt final. And I have no idea where the show is going to go from here because the entire focus pretty much has changed. But we'll, t we'll get into that. Let's just get into this episode episode because there's so much to talk about, so much happened, and uh, really, like I said, I don't want this video to be too long, even though it's probably going to be, because every time I say I don't want a video to be 40 minutes, that is exactly how long it's going to be. Anyways, guys, we don't care about this, let's just get into the episode. So, we start out, and we see this great scene where right away things are off to a great start. We see Luke, he's interrupting Zip at this gun deal. He tells him to find a new profession since Cottonmouth is done, and Zip tells him the Cottonmouth is getting out immediately since he hasn't, and that he hasn't done shit. He points his gun near Luke and runs out, and Scarf uh, death means his evidence is useless and the cops have to let him go. But the real news of this scene is that Cottonmouth's lawyer actually is none other than Benjamin Donovan. If you remember who that was, he was actually last seen uh, running King P um, Wilson's empire while he was in prison. So I thought that was interesting the way we saw that. And definitely, again, that's a very subtle connection to Daredevil. And it definitely seems like they're doing a lot here, especially with Daredevil. It seems like they're making a lot of references to that because Luke Cage is very much like Daredevil. The difference is that Luke Cage is an inhuman while Daredevil is a much different type of character, and I like the way that's done. So, Audrey tells Misty to remember who she is, and Donovan says that next time would behoove them to have actual evidence, something besides the dog's harassment of a misguided being cop. Misty asks if he's calling her a dog. Conmo says he means determined, although true, the word is derived from the description of a dog's persistence, and says that is the problem with a bitch, unless they can't get their hand on a bone, they can't let go. And that's very much what's going on with Misty. I mean, she won't stop until she gets Conmouth, and she says that they'll see who someone's bitch is when his ass is in prison, and calls him by his real name. He walks out of the precinct and is immediately bombarded with press. He gets in the van, drives away. All the reporters are chasing him, and uh, Misty then sees Luke. He walks walks away, realizing that they're not done yet, and once he leaves, a new woman comes in into the precinct for unknown reasons. We don't know who she is, but what a great way to start things off, because this immediately tells us that things are definitely far from over. I mean, it definitely seems like, at, at, you know, last, the last episode, that they caught him, that they caught the guy, and that now was going to move on to something else. I thought Dimebag was going to be introduced, but then this episode tells us that no, that's not the case. There's still a lot to do with Conmouth, and damn was there a lot to do. I mean, really, there was so much left to do with this character uh, before what they end up doing with him this episode, but I really thought it was so interesting the way it was done, and it honestly really does make sense. Scarf was the guy who had all the intel. He was the one who knew exactly what Conmouth was doing. Now that he's dead, they can't really prove that anything that Scarf said was true or not. I mean, he was the one with all the facts, and they didn't even know if he was telling the truth, and they can't even prove what he said is true or not. So I think overall that's very interesting. I really did love the way this started out, and Already things were off to a great, uh, you know, great start. But that's not even the best stuff about this episode. So, Conmouth he laugh, is laughing at the news footage of him breaking out. Says that Mariah won't like this shit. Shades says he shouldn't either. Kama says he just shot a cop and walked away. And Shades is, in fact, back in this episode. So, he says he walked away free. So, that's, you know, what's there not to like. Since uh, Zip and Amos picked up the truck from the docks right after he shot Scarf. And Domingo got his guns back last night. So, everything seems to be great. Everyone's back on his side. And then as Shades, when he gets his 
against Judas, and Shade says that he doesn't, and that he's too hot right now, and tells him Luke is a luxury like ice cream, and he needs to keep steak on the table, and Conmouth asks how he's supposed to do that with Luke around. All he has to do is show up and hood scatter like Roach. I mean, Luke will always beat him, and Conmouth is really starting to realize that in this episode. So, I really did like seeing that, because Conmouth's starting to realize, I really can't get through this guy. It just seems like he, no matter what I do, will come get me, and I can't break him, and I thought it was very interesting the way we saw that, and that's really a big part of this episode, is that Conmouth is realizing, I think, how ineffective he is, and people have been complaining, I've seen, about how ineffective Conmouth really is, and I feel like that's the point, especially with the way this episode goes out. I feel like the point is that he was supposed to be ineffective from the start. He couldn't beat Luke because he couldn't get into him, you know, he couldn't figure out what his weakness was, and unfortunately, he broke his promise right, you know, he couldn't squeeze into him, and he says he's, do he's done talking, and says to tell Diamond back, he needs to holler at him. Shades asks if he's sure this is the way he wants to play this. Combo says that he's sure, and he then takes out a distinctive ivory gun, and that leads to a flashback of him shooting someone as a teenager. We don't really know what that's about, but we do find out a lot about Codmouth or Cornell, uh, his, or his, uh, you know, origins in this episode, and I definitely really did like that. So, Fish then asks Luke about their evidence. Luke says without Scarf to corroborate that Ledger is useless, even the whole thing with Spurlock and the bodies Conmouth burned, it's not enough to stick. Spurlock will eat the charge and take the year, and he won't testify and will be his own client. So they really can't do anything, unfortunately. And you really do see the hopelessness in Luke. And Mike Coulter does such a great job. I mean, in general, he does. But in this episode especially, you really do see that hopelessness. He feels like he's done. He feels like there's nothing left to do. And... Because of them, you know, calm out the running away, he doesn't really know if he's able to beat him, and I thought it was very interesting to see that side of him throughout this episode. And that really does bring Claire more into the forefront. Now, while she did play a large role in the last episode, that episode was more of her trying to convince Luke to be a hero. This episode is her really providing the hope and, I think, just the good side of it that he really doesn't see. He doesn't really see a good side of him becoming a hero. He doesn't really see any positivity in that, and she definitely does see that. And I like the way that she kind of is his anchor. You know, she's the one that uh, makes him feel good, and that's the one that calmed him down. I really did like seeing that. So, and just, just like, uh, you know, Reva did, and I definitely think this is hinting that these two are definitely going to have a romance in future episodes, and I'm definitely all for it, because Claire is exactly who Luke needs right now, and I really did like seeing that, so... Claire asks him if this is it, tells him that setbacks happen all the time, he can still do it, he asks why, she says because he's not afraid of Conmouth, but Conmouth is clearly afraid of him, so he can really get into his weakness, and he asks her she expects him to do, since he tried to do things the right way, and cops let him go, and she says the cops can only do so much, he has the power to do more, and tells him to look at what's going on at Hell's Kitchen, and she tells him that sometimes if you want justice, you have to get it yourself, and I remember I heard that line in the trailer, I thought it was awesome then, I think it's even more awesome now, he says if Hell's Kitchen is so great, then why'd she run uptown? And honestly, this is a good question. Why the hell did she go from away from Hell's Kitchen if, it, if you know, things were better there? Because, really, they were. And it's crazy for me to say things are better in Hell's Kitchen, because we know who was running Hell's Kitchen and how crazy things were in Daredevil, you know, both seasons one and two. But things are even crazier in Harlem, and they're so much worse here. And she asks why he did. She says that there's nothing that could hurt him, so what is he so afraid of? Then Conmouth calls, asking for a parlay, and says that they can either be gentlemen about this, or they can go into some gangster shit. Luke says uh, that the parlay is fine since gangster shit hasn't worked for him very well recently. So Conmouth tells him he to meet him at Harlem's Paradise and to bring his apron. And Fish asks what he says, and Luke says enough. So it seems that there's going to be sort of like um, a you know, bearing the hatchet between these two, which I thought was interesting to see, but there's definitely more going on, we'll get into that. Misty's then looking at all the evidence that they have found, you know, from Conmouth, and Audrey tells her that it's best to take it all down, and Misty says that there's still plenty of work to be done. Audrey says not for her, tells her that she's being kicked off the team for the whole deal with Scarf, despite not having anything to do with his untimely death, because it really was as untimely as a death could be, and we see her replacement is actually Priscilla Ridley, aka the woman we saw at the beginning of the episode, which I thought was really clever the way that was done. We just randomly saw this woman, we didn't know who she was, and now we find out she's Priscilla Ridley. So Audrey tells her she's gotta play this smart, IA is gonna be up her ass with a flashlight, and Misty says she can handle Ridley since she was her lieutenant at the 31st, and Audrey says that she still has a future here, the best thing to do is to let go of the board and all, and, you know, everything that she has in it, because it's just not doing her any favors, I mean, clinging onto this board really is just her clinging onto the case, and she needs to move on, because
because clearly they can't get Cottonmouth. And Misty says that Cottonmouth needs to be in handcuffs. Audrey says to not let this twist her up to the point where she can't see which way is up. She steps out, and sad to see Audrey go, but Ridley comes in, and this is going to be awesome. She calls her by her full name, Mercedes, and she calls her Misty, says she heard they started calling her Inspector Gadget behind her back once she got promoted. Ridley says is going to be fine. That's absolutely what this is going to be. There's clearly a rival of sorts between these two. They really do not get along, and I can't wait to see it because that is so much different than what happened between Audrey and Misty, and I can't wait to see the way that's going down. It adds this whole other layer to Misty that we hadn't seen before, and I really do love that. So, Damon Boone, the councilwoman that Mariah has been calling a Stanford carpetbagger, he shows up in the flesh, and Amelia is met with tons of press who ask many questions, and he says Mariah and him don't agree on much, but assures them that she is a good woman, who loves Harlem, he's a strong believer in party first no matter what, he came as a friend in time of need, they try to get me to answer more questions, and Mariah says he's there because she asked him to, and they ask her questions about Conmouth, tells them to let to reason they uh, let Conmouth go is because of how false the charges were against him, and she's doing whatever she can to make him look innocent, because again, she does care about her cousin, that's a big part of this episode is that Mariah does care about Cottonmouth and he does care about her. And their relationship really is the focal, you know, point of this episode. Really, that's, I mean, they've been in many episodes, but this really, fo the, mo the, big the most focus, you know, there are a lot of characters, but the most focus in this episode really is primarily on Cottonmouth and Mariah's relationship and really how heartbreaking things are for them, and really how unfortunate circumstances are, and she tells them to go, and tells Boone that this is low, even for him, he says he wasn't lying, he's here as a friend, and she says he's trying to knock her off for years, and he asks how much of what they're saying is true, and he realizes how bad it is, tells her she's tainted, and the infection is contagious, and she asks him what he recommends, and he tells her she needs to step down with all the bad press her cousin is getting, and to let him take a seat and push her permits through a year from now, all four of her complexes could be up and running, and she's says that he's been trying to knock her out of her spot for six years. It didn't work then, and it's not going to now. So she tells him to find a new hobby. He says she can't stay on top forever. Tell her she's going to fall, and he'll enjoy every second of it when she does. So she tells him he needs to leave, and really doesn't seem like she's going to listen to him. You know, she doesn't really seem like she's listen, you know, willing to listen, and Alex asks her if she needs anything. She tells him Scott Shades then shows up, says they need to talk alone. We don't know what that's about, but a lot going on with Shades in this episode. So Ridley tells Misty to focus on Luke as the obvious suspect, the one common link between all her crime scenes, and of course, she's still preoccupied by the fact that they slept together. You know, she sees him as this innocent man because he didn't seem like a bad person to her. She's always had this, you know, um this emotion for him, and she's really sympathized with him, she's understood what he's gone through, and I really did like seeing that in this episode, but that really does change later, and then we get to the best stuff in this episode, which has to do with Conmouth, and uh, really just makes us care for Conmouth more than ever. One of the things that Daredevil Jessica Jones and now Luke Cage have done is really get us to sympathize with the villain just as much as the hero. And with this episode, more than ever. I mean, just like what they did with Wilson Fisk, we get a full-on flashback episode for Conmouth and... The flashbacks by far are some of the best stuff about this episode because it really looks at a Cottonmouth in a whole new direction. From the second he was introduced, I didn't really see him as a villain necessarily. I saw him more as a threat to Luke, obviously, but I didn't really see him as the full villain of the show. And this show, this episode really shows us that that's not really who Cottonmouth is. And... I really love seeing that, and the way that they used the piano as the way the transition, I thought was a really cool aesthetic, the way they did that, and I really did love that. But uh, we see sometime in the 70s a teenage Conmouth or Cornell. I'm going to call him Cornell because this is before people called him Conmouth and before he was really known to the world. He's revealed to have actually been a musical prodigy and that only his uncle Pistol Pete encouraged. And we've heard a lot about uh, Mama Maybell and Pistol Pete, but we really get into their history in this episode. And Mama Maybell tells him he needs to keep it down since Mariah is trying to study. Pistol Pete says a little music won't disrupt all the hoeing she's got going on over there. She says it's what keeps the light lights on. He says Cornell should be one. She'd be in one of those schools like Juilliard and she says there's only one school that matters. Mariah agrees that he's really good and Maybell says she didn't ask for her opinion. Pete says that she has a point and Maybell says she doesn't need him to defend her. He says he knows he doesn't because she's going to be a lawyer and I thought it was interesting the way we had that scene where 
you know, basically says she's going to be able to defend herself, but Mariah doesn't seem amused or even into the idea. She gives him this really irritated look, and we don't know what's going on there, but it definitely hints that something's going on between Mariah and Pete, and once we find out what that is, it makes that even more, you know, even more uh, interesting and just uh, give me a, you know, gives me something to give a lot more praise to the way that was done, but we see this man named Henry. He then goes to them, and he's the one who actually started calling Cornell Cottonmouth, and Cornell says he knows he hates that name. Henry says he should just call him Corny, and Pistol Pete says he's just practicing and he needs to stay right there. Maybell says he needs to get a little dirt on him, but then tells him to stay put. She tells Henry to go, tells the other man, Donnie, to stand right there with her, says her husband, his brother, and her built the Harlem game brick by brick, numbers, pussy, guns, but he knows good and goddamn well the one thing they will never sell is drugs, and asks him what he was thinking. He says he thought that he was helping them, and he says this crack, these, this, uh, crack game is is blowing up Salvador Cologne, and all of them are making mad loot. She pulls out a pair of pliers, literally cuts off his finger. One of the most graphic things I've seen any of these Marvel shows do. That was insane, and she tells Mariah to finish her homework upstairs, tells Cornell to stay right there. She says he's not dumb enough to think of some shit like this, and she asks who gave him this idea. Pete asks who he's looking at, and she tells Cornell to take him out. Pete says he's not ready for this. She says he needs to learn how to piss standing up, and Pete drags Donnie down to the basement, tells him to keep it down since they have white people in the other room, and she doesn't want to scare them off. So Cornell comes back after killing Donnie, plays the piano, and we then cut to the present day of Conmouth playing the piano, and now knowing who he is really changed our perception of Conmouth. He really wa didn't want to be this criminal, you know, he kind of was misguided, Maybell kind of forced him to, he didn't really want to be this way, and now he's kind of put himself in this position, and Luke really has broken him, and we definitely do see that, and obviously Luke is our main character, and we very much understand what Luke is going through, and understand, you know, why we need to root for him, but we're rooting for Conmouth just as much, because they really have destroyed each other, and we definitely do see that in this episode, so... Luke arrives at the parlay, says even though he hates his ass, he has talent, and he could have been somebody, and he says this is the first time he ever saw him free, he guesses now he's untouchable, he doesn't need him, Conmouth and asks if he's here to take him in, or take him out, Luke says that he called him, but unlike him, he's not a murderer, and says he's taking him in, he's gonna sit down with Misty, and he's going to confess to everything, and he doesn't really care what he wants to do, you know, he just wants to finally get some answers, and it just shows, I think, how reasonable Luke is, because I think it's a reasonable deal, and Conmouth asks if that's what he thinks is gonna happen, because the last time he checked, he's no longer a sheriff, and calls him Carl, says he, he isn't doing much of anything, which is, you know, um, actually, he says he doesn't know shit about going to prison, but he figured since he escaped and faked his death and all that other slick shit, eventually it's bound to catch up to him, and he's gotta go back. Luke says he's not turning him in, he wouldn't snitch, and Conmouth says there is no honor amongst thieves, but he isn't one. He says he gave it a speech at a church, not down a few doors in the projects, and now he's Harlem's Captain America, and really, he doesn't understand, I mean, yeah, that isn't really much he's done, but there's a lot more he's done besides that, he asks her they're gonna feel when they find out he's nothing more than a goddamn criminal, he says he acts like he's better than him, and he says he isn't, says he got caught, and Luke lets him know he was framed, and was, and is still innocent, Kamo says he owes him now, and if he refused to give in to his demands, he will send him back to Seagate, and he'll char the damn yacht himself, he'll do whatever he can to get him back to Seagate, because he knows that he really should not be there, and he says that he thought he only had a hand in one of the platters, but he owns the whole goddamn bakery, Luke walks out very disturbed, more disturbed than ever, and just the look in his face, I mean, we've never seen Luke this empty and this shooken before, I mean, the last time he was this shooken is when he found out that Jessica killed Riva, but this is completely different. This man who he thought he could easily take down and was afraid of him now knows all this stuff about his past, and this really makes him realize that maybe he can take him down, and it's this amazing moment. I love the way it was done. Shades then asks Mariah if she remembers him from when he was a kid. She says she doesn't. Asks if he's one of the people that used to follow Conmouth around like he was a puppy. He says he didn't have shit when he grew up in the street, but the one name that always rang out was Stokes, if anything happened. And, you know, if, if someone was in trouble, Stokes was always there. She asks what his point is, and he says her family name meant something. Harlem's Paradise meant something. Everyone showed Mama Maybell's love compared to what Luke has made it, and tells her that she has more people than she realizes, and when she gets the nerve, she'll be surprised at what she's capable of. That she can be, you know, this great councilwoman, but she just doesn't really have the, you know, she doesn't really believe in herself, and she doesn't really have the courage, and she just doesn't really seem to have much confidence, and he really does see it in her, and that's really a big part of what eventually happens, you know, at the end of this episode. 
So with Cottonmouth having all the information he does, Luke is pretty much ready to just run into town, but luckily Claire stops him before he does, and basically asks if that's how he's going to play this, and he says there's nothing he can do, she says enough with the defeatist bullshit, and asks him what's going on, and he tells her all about how Cottonmouth knows about his past, and everything that's going to happen if it doesn't work for him, and she says that she actually sympathizes with him, she actually understands this, and she says, but if he runs, he will be running for the rest of his life, and he asks if she's the first person who told him that, he says he told Pop that he was done running, and I loved the way this was done, because this episode, and the series in general, reiterates the fact that anyone that gets close to Luke Cage ends up dying, it seems. You know, they either betray him, they screw him over, or they end up dying. And, you know, this happened with Pop, and he talks about, you know, how this happened with Connie, and how they lost everything because of him, and he doesn't know who's next, and I think he has this fear that Claire might be next. I mean, he even told her in the last episode that if anything bad happens to you, then, you know, let me know. Like, he's very much worried that she's gonna be the next one. He says he's no good for anyone. She says that he can't take the blame for everything that's happened. People need him, and says if people see that he's one of them, that's good, and that is what he wants, after all. You know, he wants to be treated like a normal person, and... He says that if he stands and fights, they will follow him, and he says if he ends up in prison, who will want to follow him? And she reminds him, you know, how uh, about how many people died in Harlem who have been in prison, so he's really not all that special. He just thinks he is, and she says that instead of running, if he takes a shot and takes him down once and for all, they save Harlem, the community, and he frees himself or he can run forever, and the best thing to do is to, in fact, you know, help the people of Harlem, and I love the way that she's able to give him all this hope, and just see the positive side of it, which he really doesn't see, he always looks at the negative side, because again, he doesn't want to be a hero, but she's telling him that being a hero is a good thing, and I really do love the way it's his head, and again, I think it really does hint there's going to be a relationship between these two, and I'm really all for it if they're going to do that, so... I really did like that overall. Shades then goes to Conmouth, who says that he's not one to apologize. Shades tells him not to. Kama says that he was feeling him like himself a little bit earlier and didn't mean to come at him like that. And Shade says he's a, a, um, under a lot of stress. And Kama says because of Luke, he invited him over. He had to let him know. And Shades asks what he did. He says he gave him the business of that Seagate shit he told him about. And Shade says the Diamondback didn't want him to do that. And Basically, we're starting to see that Conmouth really is going too far, and that he really is starting to do things that Dimeback doesn't approve of, and that he's way in over his head, and I really did like that, and we're definitely starting to see how incompetent he is at these things, and Kamo says that Diamondback isn't his father, and knows next to nothing about Luke, which we definitely know is he knows something, I mean, there's definitely a connection between Shades and Dimeback that we really don't know about, and I'm sure we're gonna find out soon, but... Shades asks if he spooked him and asks if he's going to run. Kamo says that he will fall in line, no doubt. And we then get another flashback, which isn't as big as the last one, but definitely is just as poignant and important. And Kamo gets in trouble with Mama Mabel for disappearing when she needed him. He says that Pete took him to an audition, and she asks if he expects her to believe an audition took six hours. He says he stopped in Spanish Harlem, and she asks if he's talking about Puerto Ricans. And he says he kicked it with Salvador's little brother, Domingo. They were in the bathroom and done for a while, and... And she says he done good, and uh, basically, it seems that she now knows his information about Pete, and I thought it was very interesting we saw that. And again, I like the way that Maybell was very much controlling Conmouth. We definitely do see that here. So... If you guys remember that kid that we saw in the first episode that was, like, selling Blu-rays or something, he's actually back in this episode, and Luke goes to him, and I thought this was kind of cool the way they did this. He goes to him and asks him if, if people actually pay good money for it, and the kid recognizes him, says the next time he could do something, he could film him. Luke says that he knows he sees things, and the kid says he sees everything, and the streets know what he's been up to. Everyone's talking about it, and Luke says not everyone deserves discretion. Says he's not asking him to get involved or speak, but he needs him to help him track down Domingo, and apparently... Apparently, it doesn't take that long, because the very next scene is Luke trashing Domingo's place, and we finally get that first scene we saw in that first teaser. If you guys remember, that first teaser was Luke. He was in a fight club of sorts. There was a huge, like, fight ensuing, and uh, it ended with Luke saying that he's sick of having to buy his, you know, new clothes. So that was actually really fun to see. I like that we finally got this. I was hoping that we would get that, and that this wasn't just a scene from the teaser, but we did, in fact, get that here, and... That was awesome, and Luke is in full baddest mode at this point. I mean, this next scene was just awesome. I love the way this was done. Luke goes to Domingo and asks him where the guns are. Domingo says he doesn't know what he's talking about. Luke says it's the ones he got from Conmouth, the ones his friends died of, and Domingo asks if he thinks he can go after everyone. 
Luke says he kind of does, and I love how he casually says that. He reminds him how he can pick him up, walk him over to a bridge, and literally just throw him in the Hudson River, and tells him it's not the fall that will kill him, it will be the impact against the water. And when the water fills his lungs, before he blacks out, he'll ask himself why he didn't give him what he wanted, and naturally gives up the location of the guns being downstairs. Obviously, because he's terrified out of his mind. So Luke thanks him, gets the guns, even gets a new sweatshirt out of it, and I thought that was awesome. So Misty then finds out about Luke's complete lack of records, minus one ID and a social security number. Bailey, the guy she's working with, says he has no Facebook, no Twitter, and not even porn, and he doesn't exist. The five, uh, he was created and is a figment of someone else's imagination. Asks who he is and who made him, and she asks who he's telling. So this really gets Misty to look at him in a whole new way she hasn't before. You know, she's always kind of been his side, but now that she knows information, this really gets him to look at her, you know, look at him very different. I definitely really did like that. So... Mariah then gets a call that she's being booted from the council, and uh, just like she feared, you know, this is actually happening, and she breaks down, she gets really physical, she hurls a glass at the wall, and that really gets her to make the decision that she does in the end of the episode. I think really most emotional flashback of this episode. This flashback being here really makes the next scene that much more emotional but we go back in the 70s we see Maybell sees Pete he takes a drink she asks him what he promised Boogie on his deathbed that he'd take care of her and their business and he asks what the hell she's talking about says that he's always put this shit before anyone else says that she was his one before she was his but he let that go and she always protected her family and she says he betrayed her for Puerto Ricans and I have to say that even though we saw Maybell and Pete in this episode you really feel for their characters honestly the way that Maybell and Pete echo that of Mariah and uh, Cottonmouth. That was really well done the way they did that. And he says this shit should have been his. So Salvador and his brothers are allowed to come down on ground floor and they can't own this home city. She says that she already has everything she needs. Says pigs get fat, but hogs get slaughtered. This was all about him. And he says that she always said or she was ready with the plan. So what is it? Cornell then comes out with a gun, makes him step outside, and really is something that he doesn't want to do. He lets him know he doesn't have to do this with all the talent he has, and asks him what he's doing. You can tell that Cornell, in his mind, he really doesn't want to do this. I mean, he really, he just, he, he's pointing the gun, and he really does not want to pull the trigger, and... He says he's not built for all this, says he paid for all those lessons because he can be something better than all them, and he's not wrong. I mean, you can just see in general that Cornell has this huge range and this huge talent, and he doesn't have to be this gangster that Mama Mabel is forcing him to be. And Mariah then comes out and pretty much ruins this entire thing, says that he deserves this for what he did to their family, what he did to her. He says she laughed with him and it was a game. Mabel says she told him what to do. We basically are implied that he actually raped Mariah, and and again, that scene early in the beginning with Mariah and him and him saying that she should be a lawyer really just makes this so much more effective now knowing why she was so you know, why she was so rude towards him is because, of course, he's, you know, her rapist, and Maybell says she told him what to do, she tells him to stand up straight and do it, Pete says to look at him, Cornell takes him, and Cornell actually takes him out, and he dies, Mabel then grabs a gun, Tells him, remember, family always comes first, and such a well done scene. I love the way it was done. And then we get to what is by far the highlight scene in this episode. I mean, this scene was just incredible. Alfred Woodard and Marshala Ali just acted the hell out of this scene. And knowing what we do about these characters, and knowing now what they've been through, makes us sympathize with them more than ever. We're back in the present. Mariah is chewing out Conmouth for wrecking her career, says he needs to drop this Luke Cage shit and shut it down and get his head back in the game. He says to not lecture him about the the game he was born to this shit finally he finally got his bitch ass in his pocket and she lets him know about her having to step down as councilwoman and says the fundraising for her complex has dried up since he got arrested and her reputation is in the shithole you know it's completely it's it's over really and he says she needs to step off her high horse and get her hands dirty she says their family mama maybell taught them that and he says all the things he could have done with his life, his music, but she sent her in school and forced her him to run the streets, and she says that she sent her away to keep her away from Pete. He says she knew damn well that what that woman made him do, he was 14 years old, and he didn't want any part of it, and again, just seeing that he was misguided, this is the path he's been led on, really to show that Kamath has never really been in control of his own destiny. He has basically been forced his entire life to become this crime mob boss, and he really does not want to do that. This is probably why he only this club and why he has so many people always performing because I think it kind of gives him that hope music is the thing that really drives him and 
he knows he could have been this huge musician and he could have been very famous but again you know mama mabel kept him from that and she says pete betrayed them he says he was the only one who ever had his back mama mabel was always sheltering protecting her for all that education and she's just as shady as him she says she did all her life was protect him his junkie mother dropped him off at mabel's and never looked back his father didn't want him and she did everything tending his needs dealing with his whining and he says he saw the way she used to flirt with pete when she was running around half naked all the time says she wanted she hits him over the head with a bottle several times and then the entire focal point of the show is changed when she pushes Conmouth through his office window and he's obviously now very badly beaten I mean there's blood everywhere but then she finishes the job with a microphone stand screams she didn't want it and kills Cottonmouth yes Cottonmouth is dead and I can't believe it honestly I kind of saw it coming. I didn't see it coming this early in the game, but I definitely did, in fact, see it coming. In fact, I literally said in the last episode, I think the only way Mariah's getting out of this is by killing Conmouth. And I will tell you guys that I did know that Conmouth was going to die in this episode. I found out uh, from a spoiler thing. I didn't know how. I just knew that I wanted him to die through Mariah, and seeing Mariah be the one to kill him makes it all the more heartbreaking. But it's also the best way to end it, because she was the only one that could bring him down. She was the only one that saw his weakness, and she had the most history with him. And... Shade shows up, seeing what just went down, says that she has the nerve, and she stepped up, and she says she didn't want this. He says deep down he thinks she did, and honestly, I'm with Shades. I really think she did want this. I mean, Kana was the source of all the shit going on in her life, and... He says the first time is always the hardest. Asks her she thinks they have rubber gloves in the kitchen. She says they're right next to the dishwashing station. He says that's a great idea. Says to look at what Luke did to her cousin. And basically is going to convince her to blame Luke for all this. Which I thought was very interesting to see. And... I can't wait to see where this goes, and now I have no idea where the show is going to go, now that uh, Conmouth is dead. We'll get more into that once we get to the end of the episode, but the episode's still not over. There's still more stuff to deal with, surprisingly. We see Luke goes to Misty, and see, and she sees a sweatshirt, asks him if he's a boxer. He says what he does is CrossFit, and she says that he's always full of surprises. She hates that she doesn't know shit about him. Nobody does, and that's the problem, but out of all the people in the world, Scarf went to him for protection, and she doesn't really know why. He says that she'd have to ask him that. She says it's so convenient for him that she can't and says he texted her, asks what he wants, and he tells her in his van all for, or, or all the guns from the heist. And she asks if he thinks being a vigilante makes this all right. Says that he has no idea how much trouble he's caused. He says he knows what she's going through, finding out her partner was corrupt, losing him. It's messing with her head. And she says to not talk to her like that. He knows what she's going through. And he says he's going to take care of Conmouth and she better be ready to move on when he does. And that, you know, he's not playing around anymore. He will, in fact, take him out. And she asks what his big plan is. As if he's going to take over Harlem, he says he doesn't want it, and she asks what he wants. He says to be left alone, and I think that's truly what he wants. She says that if that's truly what he wants, he needs to give it. He wants he is to give her everything she wants right now, all of his information on record, and end it right there. And he says he's not going to do that. She says that makes him an accessory, and he asks what uh, to uh, what after happened this morning she expects him to trust the system she says the system is not his enemy and he asks how it's been treating her lately she says that he should go con mouth but he won't but he won't and he wants him to suffer you know because he wants him to feel what it's like when your life is over and everyone else's life goes on as if you don't exist really that is kind of what con mouth went through though i mean he didn't really get to live his own life he basically made basically his life was already decided for him and she says it sounds like he's speaking from experience he says that she should trust him like pop did she says if he gave her one good reason why she would and uh, that she would in fact trust him if he gave her one reason he's not giving her that reason so it's just making him more shady and i can't wait to see the way this is going to go down now the con mouth is gone there's definitely gonna be a lot more tension between misty and luke and i already really feel it and i can't wait to see the way this all goes down Misty and asks about the anonymous tip. Misty says that every cop needs a good snitch. Ridley says she's not out of the doghouse, asks for the lawn shot, and she then gets a call about Conmouth's death and just the look on Misty's face. Her being in shock and realizing that she's not the one that did this, she's not satisfied. She's definitely not, but she does feel like, okay, at least he's gone. He's dead, but Mariah's still out there, and I'm definitely looking forward to seeing where that's going to go. Luke then tells Claire his backstory, which lets us laugh some more at his ridiculous comic outfits, and she asks what his father said when he saw him, and I don't think we heard about this before, what, about his father, but... 
He says he said nothing because he doesn't know he's alive. Says he wouldn't want to see him anyway. He's his shame. And the last thing his father wanted to do was raise a black criminal. He did everything in his power to make sure that didn't happen. And yet he still went to jail. And she says that that wasn't his fault. He says he didn't see it that way. He made calls. He sent letters. He returned every single last one of them. She asked why he would let his father's last memory be him as a criminal. A dead one at that. And she thinks he'd be very impressed to know who he is now. She thanks him. Says there can't be that many people who know the, the uh, saga of Luke Cage. It means a lot that he trusts her, and he says he didn't come to Harlan to be a hero. He did because he needs to figure shit out, and she says she did it too. He says she's right. He can't keep running, but he needs her to know what she's getting into and says if Conmouth talks or if anybody connects the dots to his past, he goes back to Seagate, and... She says she knows the the uh, the wrists and did it anyway, and that's what makes him a hero. And he says maybe he should get a mask overall. She says too much happens in Harlem already in the shadows. People fear what they can't see. Obviously talking about Daredevil and how he wears a costume, and that's what makes him different. They see him, and it makes them trust him. As we know, people don't trust Daredevil because he's a masked man, but now they trust Luke Cage because he's not a masked man. They know who he is. And I thought it was interesting the way she said that, because in so many superhero shows, we see him against the hero, but in this we don't because they know who he is and he doesn't really see himself as a hero which is interesting and the mood is then killed we see this mysterious new figure we don't know who he is but he fires a Judas bullet at him says one Judas for another Claire says that she may have a lawyer who can help they fire the gun and indeed is able to penetrate his skin and I love the way that is done when he's not when he sees that he's actually shot he's obviously in shock we leave him screaming on the ground it actually has impacted him and that is the way the episode ends incredible stuff overall Let's just get into this, because I have no idea really where we're going from here. So really, this was an extremely eventful episode. I mean, so much went down in this episode, and like I said, it completely changes the show. I mean, they really made the show seem like it was going to be Luke Cage versus Conmouth the entire season. But Conmouth's dead, and I still am trying to grapple the fact that he's dead. And yes, like I said, a lot of people are going to compare it to Daredevil, Penny, and, you know, Pennies and Dimes, that episode. The difference is with that episode, yes, Punisher was taken in that episode. Yes, he was taken to jail. And yes, that story, then it started to focus more on Elektra and less on the Punisher. The difference is they didn't kill Punisher off halfway through the season. They literally killed Conmouth off, and this, in my opinion, is a great decision. I really do love the way this is done, because it shows that no matter what Conmouth did, as calm as he was, he wasn't confident enough to take down Luke Cage. He just couldn't do it, and he didn't, he, because he didn't want it. He didn't want to be a crime boss. He didn't really have that confidence in himself. He wanted to be a piano player. He wanted to do all this stuff, and he ended up screwing Mariah over in the process. He ended up ruining most of what he built, and and I'm thinking Mariah is going to be our new villain now. That's what I'm thinking, at least. I think she's going to be our main threat. Diamondback is definitely the one that shot Luke. I definitely know that for a fact. And... Luke, we know, obviously isn't going to die, but Diamondback is going to be someone that is going to weaken Luke, and I can't wait to see the way that's going to turn out, because they've set up Diamondback so well that I really hope he doesn't let us down. I mean, they really have a lot to live up to with this character, and I really hope he doesn't let us down, but we'll have to see the way that all turns out. Misty and Luke, I love the interplay between these two. Again, you can definitely see that she now really isn't believing him. This is a whole new Luke, and she really hasn't thought of most of, you know, now that she sees who he really is, and now that she's seeing really what he's capable of and now that he you know that his forged this identity she really does not trust him as much and i think that's gonna be a big part of uh, the rest of the season i can't wait to see the way that turns out and again the way that claire is really evoking this hope in him i really am loving the way that's going uh, and again i really think there's a romance in it those you know um between those two at some points some people are saying that Conmouth isn't dead. No, he's definitely dead. She fucking hit him with a microphone stand. We heard his bones crack. I mean, he's definitely dead. There's no way that he's going to come back. Obviously, it was a very short run. And honestly, I kind of had this feeling he was going to die soon because it really did seem like they were going fast with his plot. But, I mean, Marshall Mar 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 Ali just gave an incredible performance. I have to applaud him because he was just incredible in this role. Very sad to see him go, but honestly, I think it was the right time. I mean, they did what they could with his storyline. They drew it out as long as they could, and I don't think it could have lasted longer than another episode. And honestly, when we start seeing everything we were, I'm like, something is going to happen with Conmouth that's going to connect everything together, and I think definitely that's going to be the thing. We might not be done with him forever, though. We might see him in flashbacks with Mariah. You know, Mariah's still out there, and as long as Mariah's there, Conmouth is still sort of a part of the story. So I'm looking forward to seeing the way that's going to turn out. Now... 
Shades has really gone into her ear, and it really does seem like Mariah does like what she's doing. That Mariah really should have been the crime lawyer. You know, she should have been the one that Mama Mabel took under her wing. She was trying to protect Mabel, obviously because of what Pete did to her. But really, I think in reality, Mariah really did want to kill Conmouth because Conmouth was the source of all the shit going on in her life, and he was the only way to get rid of it. And I think now she's going to go out there. She's going to be this new, darker, dark uh, Black Mabel, I think her name is in the comics, that we've seen. I'm definitely looking forward to no, Not Black Mabel. Black Mariah uh, that we've seen, and I can't wait to see the way that, that turns out. We definitely know there's some sort of tension going on with Misty and, you know, Ridley overall, so I can't wait to see the way that turns out as well, because there's definitely a lot of interesting stuff between those two. I think that's going to be really interesting. We still don't know why Luke was put behind bars. We don't know who framed him. We don't know what the crime was. We don't know that stuff yet. So there's still a lot of stuff to get through. And the fact that we're only on episode 7 really is just, it baffles me. It really does. We're on episode 7. They've already killed off the big villain in the show, who really, in my opinion, was not a villain. What Conmouth was, was a misguided person. You know, he was someone who wanted so much more. He could have done so much more. But instead, he was led into a dark path and really couldn't stop himself. And then when he became so fixated on killing Luke, everything else was just crumbling behind him and he just didn't see it. And I think they portrayed that so, so well, honestly. I think this is one of the best portrayals they've ever done of any villain that Marvel's done. Comout will is definitely going to be one of the best parts of the show. And... I don't really know where the show is going from, but at the same time, I can't wait to see where it goes from here. I mean, after something like this, and after such a ballsy decision, it really does show how great of a show Luke Cage is, and I can't wait to see the way the last six episodes are going to play out, because it's really getting crazy so far, and really, so far, this has been an incredible season, but I, re but really, the entire show is going to change. I can't wait to see the way that's going to be, but let me know what you guys saw this episode. Loved your thoughts on it. I could go on and on about this episode. This is by far one of the best episodes I've seen of any TV show this year absolutely loved everything about it just incredible stuff fired on all cylinders and really i think perfectly touched into the emotional relation between mariah and conmouth we really didn't know most of what we did and i'm glad that we know all we do now because it makes us care so much more about him i mean i cared about conmouth before i thought he was a really great character but i didn't care about him as much as i did before he died and they did such a great job with doing that definitely and they really used him to his best ability i loved what they did with him but that's my review hope you guys enjoy it we'll see you guys next video which I promise will be for Empire, and I will see you guys for that. Okay, bye.